How many hours and years of our lives do we spend on work? For nearly all of us, we spend 30 plus years and one third of our days in our vocation. More time, perhaps, than we spend at rest or at play. But this isn't a problem. Why? Because work is good. Work needs to be integrated deeply into our lives and must be in line with our most important goals and values. And if it is, we have a far more complete and fulfilling life experience. Welcome to the How People Work podcast, where we explore the intersection of how humans think and act and how they apply themselves to their work. When you understand both of these things, you'll be equipped to be insightful, compassionate, and compelling leaders. Welcome back to How People Work. Uh, I'm one of your hosts, Jordan Peace, Jason Murray, hey alongside me as usual. Um, we had a great episode last week. I thought we had a great. I'm self congratulating. So we, yeah. we had we had an enjoyable. It was episode. enjoyable. I enjoyed it. People might have liked it. They, they might not have. It. They might have hated it. But, but I, I enjoyed, enjoyed it. it. You seem to enjoy it. Uh, we were talking about uh, well being, and yes. we got um, we got on some. Uh, I don't want to say high horses, but we we got passionate about some ideas around well-being and what it ought to be, what it means, that it's a deeper idea. Talked about the World Health Organization. We talked about some Jewish wisdom literature from 4,000 years ago. Uh, we, we really ran the gamut of um, sources in terms of thinking through um, well-being in today's world and why this topic has resurged as something really relevant to the employee experience, to attracting and ret retaining and keeping employees, et cetera, et cetera. Um, one of the things I noticed in the show notes in preparation for this week is that you had this phrase, well-being. We're going to continue with well-being if you haven't picked up on that, uh, listeners. Well-being is the thermostat. So often you hear analogies, and hey, this is the thermometer, this is the thermostat. I assume that's where we're headed here. But Frame up for us what is meant by well-being is the thermostat. Yeah, well, you, you just jumped right to the punchline. I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I mean, when I was thinking about this topic of well-being, uh, I couldn't help but think about what are the metrics by which companies often sort of gauge the success that they're having with people. Mm-hmm in the organization and uh, and last of, week we criticized and said it is not engagement we yes because we don't well we said engagement is more complex than it's often thought but to then be. off camera we really ragged on it even further <laughs> let's be honest i will neither confirm nor deny this <laughs> um and so there's there's sort of this sense of like all roads lead to attract and retain yeah and so i i can't help but remember a couple of years ago we were part of an accelerator program where we were, um, you know, basically in small group settings right. with, you know, anywhere from eight to 10 different people, leaders over right. the course of a number of weeks. And so I think I spoke with, you know, in just a few weeks, over a hundred different people, leaders. Right. And when I kind of pressed people on like, yeah, you know, everyone talks about engagement everyone talks about well being, but like what really matters. And like, mm. when you kind of got people like off the record, everyone's like, yeah, attract and retain. Right. You're know, like, yeah, I thought so. Thought I thought, so. That, I thought yeah. that's what it was. So you want to have like really great employees and then you want them to stay. Yeah. Okay. That makes, that makes a whole lot of sense. And so uh, like what I think is interesting about that is it does matter, right? I mean, we run a business yeah. and there's costs to running a business and there's real and material matters to be considered when it comes to attracting good people and keeping them here. You yeah. can even think of it in terms of, you know, employee lifetime value. Right. You know, like you're going to hire somebody, you're going to pay them. Like, are we going to get output from that individual that's commensurate with, yeah. you know, the productivity of the overall organization? Like it's, it's, it's necessary. You're a monster. Yeah, I, you I want, am. You want it's productivity true. from employees. I'll take that on to save you're, you you're from that criticism, Jordan. <laughs> so send all your hate comments to me, <laughs> Jason Murray on LinkedIn. I think it's I think it's okay to, oh, is it? to want productivity okay. from people you pay money uh, to. Well, and so there's tension though between like, yeah. you know, maybe what an employer wants, what an employee, sure. like what, yeah. how an employee might perceive some of that. Right. Like, um, but I think the problem with both of those things, when we think about attract and retain is uh, they're thermometers, right? They're not thermostats. Mm. 
you know, when most people are taking readings of their metrics as it pertains to recruitment metrics, as it pertains to retention, we're simply looking at what happened in the past. Mm. How well did we do? Right. And it, so it's what we would call a lagging indicator. Measuring outcomes. What's measuring the temperature outcomes. in the room right now? Right. And right. so there's only so much that you can do with that. And I think what's interesting, you know, we measure this stuff with our customers. And so we know things like, for instance, companies that offer flexible benefits have 84% higher loyalty, employee loyalty than their competitors. And that's almost two times better, which means these companies are also most likely to have better retention Presumably, if we believe that sense. loyalty is a leading indicator right. of retention. And so when I say well-being is the thermostat, I think it's one of those things that is a leading indicator of what's going on inside of an right. organization. So you want people to stay, treat them well, right. make them feel cared for, give them the tools that they need to be healthier, happier, purpose-driven individuals, mm. right? And I think that is the reason or the context for why well-being uh, is this important topic for us to discuss. Yeah, it's funny when you were talking about attract, I, like again, off camera, just side conversation, one of the things that came up was this idea of w how people choose to work where they work or how they choose a boyfriend or a girlfriend or how they choose a spouse or whatever the case may be. And what I was taught at an early age, and maybe I had just exceptional mentors and people in my life was, hey, figure out who you are, right? Like figure out your identity mm -hmm. and then figure out what your mission is. And then when you are running, chasing down your mission, kind of look to your left and look to your right as you're running along, and see who's running alongside you, maybe that person could be the person you might want to marry someday, like the person you might want to spend your life with. Like maybe that's your mate. You know, the mm -hmm. idea was like mission and mate, you know? And like this, so that was apparent to me that like, hey, I, I've got a mission that is sort of higher and greater, and that is the thing that my life is dedicated to. And I should probably find people in my life, whether that's a spouse or friends or whomever, that are kind of on that track. And so when I go to look for a job, I should look for someone that is advertising, this is our mission, this is our vision, these are our values. Oh, that's aligned with me, mm -hmm. right? I should, maybe this makes sense. I'm gonna go apply, I'm gonna go see it and check this thing out. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think more often than not, we've got people coming in and they get really lit up about the mission or the vision or whatever, but they don't know if it aligns to their own because they don't have one. Right. Right. So they adopt the company's mission and they are attracted to use the, the word here yeah. by by that. But then they don't stick around because all of that early fervor sort of dies out when it's just like, well, I don't know. I guess I don't really care about that that much anyway. Right. You know, yeah. it, it was just a job. You know? Right. But everything's always going to be just a job. Right. You yeah. Know? With, without well, a. I mean, I think for very few people is, you know, the company's mission ever going to be like the penultimate, you yeah. know, sort of thing. That well, maybe the penultimate, but not the ultimate. Not the, <laughs> yeah. Okay, fair enough. Uh, yeah. You know, for you as an individual, I yeah. mean, it, it seems a little... They should align. They should align. Yeah. But it seems preposterous to right. see like, man, when I hop out of bed in the morning, like I couldn't be more excited right. about the mission yeah. of the company that I work for. Right. Right. Yeah. Like, I hope that people, I hope that that is a, uh, maybe a secondary right. like thing that yeah. brings value and meaning to them. Totally. I hope what they wake up and say is like, Hey, like the people that I love, the people that I care for, right. my spouse, my significant other, my children, my friends, my community, my local community, my broader community, whatever the case may be. Like I have a, a laid out set of values and and purpose right. in terms of what I'm trying to accomplish there. Yeah. And then what's great is you can uh, take that to you know what you're describing with uh, an organization and say, hey, to the degree that the mission of the company matches or aligns with some of those values, mm -hmm. that's awesome. But if it doesn't, or if it doesn't perfectly, because how many of them will perfectly align right. to everything you care, right? Probably none of them. Yeah, You can still say, well, the things that I'm doing at this organization are still enabling me to be successful in these other areas of my life. Mm -hmm. So actually something we were just talking about off camera too was the, the uh, we sometimes rag on our parents' generation. You know, cause sometimes. Like, yeah, they, yeah. 
worked for 35 years, 40 years in yeah. jobs that they hated. And, you know, it's easy to criticize that and just say like, oh, yeah, they just like put their heads down and didn't even think about it. But what motivated them, you know, if we want to shine a light on the positive aspect right. is they did it for their family. Right. They had that ultimate purpose for them yes. that motivated them to move through what was probably just a terrible set of working circumstances mm. that they hated and I think that's part of what we criticize is like after 40 years of that, it just kind of beats you down yeah. and you see what it's done to them. Yeah. But at the same time too, there has to be a little admiration, I think, for totally. the fact that they had something so significant to them yeah. that it drove them to actually make that sacrifice. Yeah. We might even call it uh, for their I think, family. I think it's the right word. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think it is. I think it's incredibly commendable and it's and it's sad to me that the paradigm that we've set up is like, it's one or the other. Right. You know, you have this great like purpose in life and work is just toil. Yeah. And it's I like, don't like binaries. Right, exactly. Right. I know you don't, <laughs> right? It, it toil, it's just toil and hardship and suffering and pain. It's like, but it's all for this great higher purpose. And, mm -hmm. and honest, honestly, if I had to pick one or the other, I probably would pick that, Yeah. you know, rather than having a job that, kind of as much as it possibly can feels really good. I love my coworkers and we're having a great time. Right. But I have no freaking clue why I'm doing it. Right. Other than to pay bills. Yeah. So that I can go spend more money to receive higher bills so that I can make more money to go out and, and buy more stuff to receive higher bills. Right. right. Like if I'd rather have the great purpose than the crappy job. Yeah. You know? So I, I think when it, you know, this retract and retain, my point was I was trying to make there is, I assumed that starting our business, that we would attract people through really promoting our mission, vision, and values, and that those, maybe the values, probably most predominantly, would speak so loudly that when people were interviewing or they were checking out our website or whatever, they would go, hey, those are also my values, I'm in, right? And we have seen some of that. We've seen some right. like really mature, like I would say like fully integrated adults that have gone, oh, that I see it like right. that is what I value too. I am in, and those have been the happiest, you know, most engaged, most whatever word you want to throw in there. People at Fringe, um, and I think they're going to stick around to the end, whatever the end is, and however far away the end is, because right. they're just like this. This is this feels like home. This feels like me. This feels right. like I created the company because it's so well aligned with who I am. Yeah. Right. And then you still have others that I think were a little bit more flashes in the pan. Yeah. I was like, Oh, this feels good. I like how these people like treat each other. This is cool. But yeah. like there just wasn't a core mature idea of what, what I'm about and what my world's about, what my worldview is. Right. And so the charm sort of wore off after a while. Yeah. Right. And it was just like, well, I just kind of want more perks, more benefits, more stuff, more pay. Yeah. More, 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 more. Right. Yeah. That's what's going to keep me here, make me happy, like buy my loyalty. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. So, so I think as you go about recruiting, like you got to think about who you're recruiting. Don't just recruit people that have the skill set. Don't just recruit people that seemingly think that you're, you're, software or whatever the thing that you do is cool. Like, oh, I'm just like such a fanboy, fangirl of what you guys do. It's such a cool thing. Mm -hmm. Okay. What are you about? Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. like you, you got to, and it doesn't really matter what the answer is. It just right. matters that there is one. Is there an answer? <laughs> is there right. an answer Can to you what are you about? Right. Can yeah. you artic articulate a worldview, yeah. right? A purpose. Um, and if they can't, I don't think that necessarily means that like, well, you absolutely don't hire this person because that's what development is for and that's what training is for. And right. that's that's kind of part of the job, especially like younger people that just haven't had a lot of life experience to kind of figure this stuff out. Yeah. You know, but I think it's a huge red flag, right? If somebody is just is, like, yeah. well, I got skills. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I can do the job. Like, yeah. Okay. Yeah, what's really interesting, I mean, this is a little bit of a sidebar and then I, I want to bring us back, but you know, in the role that I'm serving in at Fringe now on the innovation side, that, that's actually a topic that I'm really excited about right. because at least from the research that I've done around the psychological literature and so forth, it, 
indi would seemingly indicate that there's a pretty low threshold for how much time people need to spend thinking about their purpose mm. and setting a few goals mm -hmm. in order to actually make a really substantive change in yeah. how um, they feel you know, from a standpoint of like their own sense of well-being and then right. how that translates into productivity and so forth. So much so that, um, you know, there's certain assessments that just have you sit down, you know, think about your life a little bit, yep. come up with a few goals that might be meaningful. Yeah. You probably won't get it perfect the first time, but right. in about 90 minutes, these researchers found that in about 90 minutes of doing this, that they could see a 30% increase in productivity from individuals simply because they actually had a greater sense of purpose now in the work that they were doing day to day. I mean, it's so wild that like, it's not this monumental task that right. I think sometimes it feels like, like, right. oh man, I gotta figure out my life's purpose. Like, how the hell do I do that? Right. It's like, no, actually just the first step is pretty small. <laughs> You know. Yeah, and I think when people start a new job, it's like the perfect timing. It's like mm -hmm. this, it's it's an auspicious opportunity, right, if you will, to go, okay, I'm in a period of transition. There's something very new about my life. Yeah. Now's the moment. And I feel like people respond really well when they first come into an organization and you hit them with that type of training Right, I think it'd be super cool to kind of build that in, yeah, for organizations. So yeah. anyways... Uh, I want to bring us back to this Deloitte study yes. so that we actually get to it. Didn't we promise about 15 minutes ago we were talking I about a Deloitte so, study? Yes. Right. Um, and so, you know, maybe a little bit of a recap. In the last episode, we talked about this more holistic um, kind of definition that's put forth yeah. in this article. And so just to recap that a little bit, the study references the World Health Organization um, who lays out a framework for well-being um, or employment rather as a social determinant of health. Right. Uh, meaning that they see, you know, employment or your work as a really substantial and significant part of your overall well-being. Mm. Um, and so sort of it's inescapable. It's just as important as, you know, your community is just as important as your physical health, like your, your work and employment is a significant part of that. And one of the things that we talked about that I think is really useful is the sense that it extends beyond sort of the typical categories that we talk about in the employer space, mm. which are usually limited to physical, mental, and financial. And what the World Health Organization is saying, no, it's bigger than that, right? It's, you know, social, it's communal, it's, you know, your sense of purpose, your sense of, you know, I have the ability to grow and learn, right? It's a more holistic yeah. kind of viewpoint of this. And so um, the article in Deloitte refers to this in the sense of human sustainability. And I got real excited when I saw that because I thought, oh my gosh, we talk about human flourishing all the time. And so it felt very analogous. It felt so, vindicated with your phrase. I did, yeah. I mean, these, yeah. <laughs> I mean, on the one hand, I'm like, I don't know, they're consultants. Like, I don't know how I feel about like, you know, <laughs> saying the same, but. They're, they're yeah. good ones though. They're talking about it <laughs> yeah. at least. So vindicated yeah. in that sense. Yeah, um, I, I love this. Um, this uh, diagram that you shared in the show notes here. And I think we ought to just read it since obviously folks aren't seeing this here. So, so there's a, uh, there's a matrix here, left side, right side, left side being legacy thinking, right side being forward thinking. And that's where this ambition for human sustainability is coming from. And there's three blocks here, right? The first of which says well-being equals finding balance between work and life. That's the legacy thinking, right? That's what well-being as, is defined as, right? Is if I just find work-life balance, then I'll be good mm -hmm. because work is the negative, stressful, hard thing, and life is the perfect, you know, idyllic moment of rest and peace right. and prosperity and everything else, right? And if I just balance the two and, and keep away that horrible work stuff as much as possible, then I can I got a chance of being happy yep. and sustained and fulfilled, uh, which I have a lot of sarcasm in my description there. Then there's this forward thinking idea of work as a determinant of well-being. So, so work is a determinant of well-being and part of life. Work directly shapes the condition of an individual's well-being. So let's stop there. So looking on the left side, this idea, and again, I, my sarcasm probably uh, betrayed a lot of what I'm about to say here, but this idea that it's about a balance mm -hmm. in, and that is going to solve the problem I think is the negative side. We were praising the previous generation, their kind of willingness to suffer, but the negative, of course, being, as we said before on the show, 
that the idea that work is just bad. Mm-hmm. Work is bad, right? We just want as right. little of it as we can. It's a transaction for value. Yeah. That's all it is, nothing more. Right, and then life is like all, as if life is just all good right. and easy, <laughs> you know? I <laughs> often find life harder than work personally. Yeah. I don't know about I'm you. I'm laughing because I think about kids again. I'm like, <laughs> right. anyone listening that has kids, they're like, ha, life yeah. is easier. Right, exactly. I mean, we, we have eight kids between us. Right. I mean, it, which is easier, Friday night or Monday morning? Yeah. You know, <laughs> like Monday morning is a cakewalk yeah. by comparison to Friday night. You can night. ask our wives, they'll yeah. tell us. Yeah, exactly. Um but, and so, you know, obviously that is legacy thinking in a way that we've, we've discussed a lot. And then, whereas this idea around work being a determinant and of well being and work being part of life, like that's actually really refreshing to see yeah. that particular phrase, work is part of life. I agree. I yeah. agree. Yeah. And I, I don't think it can be overstated. I mean, they're using, you know, clinical terminology, you know, coming out of the worth. Uh, World Health Organization, like these determinants of yes. such and such. But I mean, it just basically means like you can't extract it, right? It's not yeah. dichotomy. Yeah. You know, it's not this other thing. It's like it, not only is it just an inescapable part of life, yes, but it's actually a valuable part of life and we should see it as such. It's funny. I told you about this, but I don't, I'm trying to, this is a long tangent. I'm not going to take us out. I <laughs> promise. But that Apple TV show Severance, I told yeah, you about this. Thing, I haven't watched right? it yet. It's crazy. I mean, it's literally that they, they, they are severing people's brains in such a way that when they're at work, awesome. they have no idea who they are outside mm-hmm. of work. They don't know if they have a spouse. They don't know, like they have no clue. And at work, they are a new person personality they give them the same first name right but they only know work yeah. it's and like and if they've worked there for a year they feel as though they are a year old like they don't have experiences beyond that one year yeah. right it's wild but like you when you watch something like that it highlights just how like duh it is right well that that's what these i was gonna two say things yeah. must be integrated because the characters whether they're the people that only know work or the people that only know like home they spend their entire existence trying to figure out who the other person is and yeah. what they do and what they're like and what they yeah. enjoy. That's all, they, they obsess over it. Yeah. So they're constantly thinking about the other thing that they're not integrated with. Yeah. That they don't have the knowledge of. So, man, yeah, it's so it's wild. Fascinating. Yeah, because, I mean, if you think about it, uh, that, like the premise there, well, one, I don't know about anyone listening to it, but like, the reaction I have is yeah. like, oh my gosh, that is so weird. It's weird. It's, it's horror, and really. It's, it's more it's, of a horror show right, than anything else. Right, like yeah. it's wrong. And yeah. I, I feel like most people would probably have that reaction of like, something about that doesn't feel right. Yeah. I, maybe I can't articulate what right. doesn't feel right about yeah. it. But if you, what's happening there is you're taking the premise of work life, work life balance yeah. and playing it out to the logical like extreme. Perfecting it. Right. right. And you're saying, okay, we want, we want to separate these things. Yeah. Here's the, extre- the most extreme version. Right. And when we see that, we say, oh, no. Oh, no. That no, is no, no, not no, what no, we no, want. No. No, <laughs> yeah, no, 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 like no, no. inhumane. Yeah, never mind. Yeah. I don't want that at all. So, I mean, that I think that should tell us yeah. just intrinsically that there's something that, you know, we're not wired for yeah. it to be that way. Yeah. I mean, it's th- this the show might, you know, you might have a couple of like uneasy night's sleep. So I'm not going to like recommend it fully, but like <laughs> it is very fascinating. And ironically directed by Ben Stiller, who I've only oh. ever seen do comedy. So it's it's pretty ironic. Interesting. The, the second section here, well, so this is interesting. This is, speaking of generational differences, this is huge. Mm-hmm. Well-being is the responsibility of the individual. That is the legacy thinking, right? Mm-hmm. And, and the subtext, organizations believe individuals have primary agency over their well-being and do not acknowledge the ways that work has an impact that individuals cannot control. Right side, forward thinking, well-being is a shared responsibility. So in this case, organizations are accountable for designing work that enables in, uh, individuals to use their agency to maintain well-being. Creating an environment conducive to well-being is a responsibility of leaders and a core component of their skill set. Mm-hmm. So pretty fascinating because I think we would agree wholeheartedly with the right side that it is a shared responsibility. Yes. 
But I think what we've seen in practice, though, sadly, is that we've seen in some cases that the pendulum swung too far. I know you hate binaries. It swung too far, whereas, hey, instead of well-being as a shared responsibility, well-being is the responsibility of the employer. Right. Well, and that right? com- I think that comes out of the dichotomy of work-life balance where work is bad. So if work is right. bad you as the employer are you know, doing bad things you need to, to make me it less bad because right. it's work. And so you need to make it less bad for me. Right. right? And that yes. comes from, you know, as an individual. So it's not just employers need to rethink that framework. It's like as an individual, if that's how I'm going to approach it, it's going to be hard for me to see it in any other way. Yeah. But if right. I'm willing to approach it and say, Hey, what is there? And like, it's, it's a little interesting that we do this in the work setting yeah. because, you know, when it comes to health, for example, like physical health, do we blame other people yeah. for the outcomes of our physical health? Like, right. well, I mean, we sometimes, might, but people, like, ultimately, you know, what I put in my body. Doctors have a lot of liability insurance as a well, result. That's of that. true, but yeah, <laughs> but yeah. Right. I was uh, something I was listening to recently, though, um, and I'd have to find the the kind of source for this, but they said eighty uh, percent of your uh, physical health uh, or eighty percent of your health outcomes are uh, just physical lifestyle things that you do. Wow. And 20% are, you know, hereditary, and, right. you know, more clinical yeah. kind Stuff of Stuff you literally thing. can't control. Right, that. which means that like, hey, that 80%, like I'm primarily responsible for right. like, right. what are my sleep habits? Yes. Like, what do I eat? Do I exercise, right. you know, minimally, so on right. and so forth. Right. And so, um, but there is this idea that like your employer controls, quote unquote, like one third of your time. Yes. You know, can determine how, like, Which is significant. where you work and when you work and how many yeah. meetings you're in and so forth. And so in that sense, I think there is a shared responsibility, even on the physical health side, yes. to create a conducive environment. Yeah. So I think right. that's the important thing, right, is uh, making sure that we're helping to remove some of that tension. So, yeah. you know, this uh, survey of HR leaders that I did recently uh, actually highlighted the fact that you know, the perception of HR folks uh, for the most part is that there's a significant tension between the needs of employees and the needs of the business. Mm. And so I think, you know, what we need to help do is sort of figure out like where are the areas that the interests are aligned. And I think right. that comes back again to the human flourishing. Right? Yes. Well, I think the interests can be aligned around these areas where when individuals are doing better right. is better for the business, right? right? In terms of productivity, attract yes. and retain, so on and so forth. Right. So. But there's some beliefs, I think, that need to be turned around for that to actually work, mm-hmm. right? If work is just bad and the avoidance of work is yeah. is really the whole goal, then it literally doesn't matter what an employer does. Right. You could pay great wages, you could give great benefits, great PTO, et cetera, but really the whole goal is just to work as little as possible and to get paid as much as possible for yeah. it, right? Yeah. You, you can't fix that one. Like yeah. people have to adopt this attitude that work is good and work is meaningful and it's actually part of being that fully integrated adult, right? With a mission, with a purpose, with character, right? That work is part of how I play out like in the theater of the world, the thing that I've been put on this world to do, right? Yeah. right? Well, yeah, yeah, totally agree. The last section here, just so we can more fully cover the Deloitte study and less our own musings for once. <laughs> the the left side of the legacy thinking, the best solution is to offer perks and benefits, right? Organizations believe their role in workforce well-being stops at the offering of benefit packages, opt-in programs, and wellness perks. Man, have we seen that. <laughs> uh, and the right side, organizational structures impact well-being. So well-being is a measurable outcome of the way organizations are designed and the norms that determine how work is done. So not to say benefits are bad, perks are bad, opt-in programs are bad, wellness perks, th- those things are great. The problem is the box-checking attitude. Yes, Right. Of just like, look, hundred percent. I gave you the stuff. Yeah. Love the stuff. Use the stuff. Use it. <laughs> right? It's your responsibility. <laughs> it's your responsibility. I've washed my hands. Yeah, exactly. Right. Very Pontius Pilate. But like this idea that it's about the norms that determine how work is done, the design of the culture, the design of the work the again, it's right back to this, like cultivating the right environment. Yeah. Right. Yeah. hundred percent. So I mean, to me, what stands out in that is that 
you know, we're talking about the employee experience is sort of how I would summarize, like, what are these, you know, if you were to combine perks, benefits, organizational structure, so on and so forth, all these things that impact, I just call that like, that is the employee experience, yes. right? Yeah. And it has to be designed with intentionality. Yeah. And that's literally the imperative, mm. I think, of the HR profession now, right? Mm. It's not just benefits. It's not just, you know, whatever silo compliance right. administration that HR has often been put in. I think the key role that HR has to play and probably only they can uniquely play is this designer of the employee experience mm. because they stand in between, right? The needs of the business and the executive teams and so on and so forth and the people, yeah. right? They're most capable and in the position to understand what the people need and what the business needs. I don't know that you know this, but we have a person at Fringe whose title is an employee experience designer. Yes. Did you know that that's the title? I didn't know that. <laughs> I knew that. Yeah. Uh, which I kind of thought was at the time that that title was given like a very kind of novel mm -hmm. idea. Like I had not seen that out there, but I think it is like a really apropos description of exactly yeah. what the role should be. Um, Last thing I'll say on this is I, I, the language here, the norms that determine how work is done. I, norms is a soft word for rules, mm. right? <laughs> like the rules of engagement. Right. right? And I, it's so important. I was listening to something recently about um, games. And I, we're going to talk about this next week, I think. We're going to talk about play, yeah. right? But the idea around games, games don't work unless there's rules, Right? right? You can't play a game. You right. can't enjoy a game. You can't have any predictability that any certain strategy is going to yield a certain outcome right. because other, it's, it's just kind of chaos, right? Yeah. And children play games this way sometimes, yeah. right? Especially small children. Or they change the rules as they go along or they have no rules at all or they break them with no consequence. And, yeah. and then what immediately happens and ensues is chaos, right. right? It's fighting and screaming and yelling and he's cheating and he lied and he, you know, like right. whatever, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's, we, this is on the right side, by the way. This is the forward thinking side, right? right? So I think when we think about, well, there's rules and there's norms and there's, you know, it's too buttoned up, it's too old, it's old school. But actually, I think what gives people the ability to have freedom in their work and the ability to thrive in their work mm -hmm. is to know kind of what is the ideal. Right. Like what, what are, what are we like here? How do right. we work? How do we treat each other? When do we work? Where do we work? Right. You might be flexible about that answer, but you have an answer, right. To those questions. And I think sometimes I can be guilty of like maybe giving people this impression that's just like, well, it just, just do it how you do it. Just do your thing. It's cool. Like right. I want to be the buddy. I want to be like the bro, you know, and as opposed to thinking like, no, actually, we have a well thought out way that we get work done right. and how we treat each other, how we do that work right. and, and putting some parameters in place and actually putting some, you know, I, we used to talk about children a lot, but uh, actually putting some uh, rules in place, right. uh, rules of engagement, it's actually quite freeing yeah. and leads to well-being. We can't win right. at something if you don't understand the rules. If you don't know how the game is Or played. if there are no rules. If there are no rules. Right. Yeah. Right. So we need those to understand, you know, how we're making progress and so forth. And yeah. there's really interesting research on all that stuff too, because if we're not making obvious progress in ways that make sense to us, then it actually causes stress and so on. And so, you know, those norms and rules are actually really important. And I think what's kind of being specified is not the fact that there aren't norms today, right. but they're the wrong ones. Right, they're need, arbitrary. They're arbitrary, yeah. they're not, we, we need new norms. Like the yeah. world's changed, how we work's mm. changed you know, people have changed, their expectations have changed, like, like our life experience just with the world has changed. Like, so we need new norms. Yeah. So, so I'll, I'll recap that as we were wrapping up the episode. Work is a, ter a determinant of well-being. Well-being is a shared responsibility. I think that's super important. Mm -hmm. I think we can't go old school and just say, well, you know what, you want to be happy? Figure that out at home. <laughs> but when you're here, you work, right? <laughs> Um, and we can't also swing the pendulum too far and just like, oh, welcome to, you know, welcome to the asylum. Like we're, we're going to make everything perfect for you and everything uh -huh. like, you know, we're going to take care of every single need. The asylum. I don't right? know why you chose that word. <laughs> I don't know why I chose that word either, but <laughs> it just makes me crazy. Like thinking about this idea of like, yeah, it's your job to make me happy. Yeah. You're like, no, nah, 
it's like it's preschool or something. Shared responsibility, yeah. right? Yeah. Just come on in, just have fun. Yeah, right. Yeah. No no rules, just yeah, enjoy yourself. Play at the stations. Uh, and then lastly, organizational structures impact well-being. And so I think Jason put it incredibly well. It really kind of the the job, the um, the whole purpose of HR at this point is really just thinking about designing an employee experience in which people know the rules of engagement, they know how to be successful, they're fully integrated adults that like have known and have been trained how to think through their purpose and their mission in life and how that aligns to the mission of the company or doesn't. And if it doesn't, we kind of coach them out, right? <laughs> so they can go find alignment. Um, I think that is the job these days, not to check boxes, not to just throw benefits and perks and offerings, right? Um, and, and, and check those boxes off, but to really design a conducive environment mm -hmm. for well-being. Yeah. Yeah. So hit me up with the word of the day next week so I can be... I got you. I can be in preparation. Word of the day for our next episode is equivocal. 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 Yeah. Which is not like equivalent or equal or equitable or I'm going to have to look that one up. <laughs> I know the prefix, but that's about it. Uh, well, thank you for listening to how people work this week. I uh, really enjoyed Jason. Thanks for the, uh, the preparation and the insights as usual. And uh, we'll see you next week. 